Let's grab our hymn books as we get started this morning. It's number 22. Number 22 in your hymn books. Let's all stand. We'll be singing, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? Number 22 in your hymn book. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We're on number 22 in our hymn books on that second stanza. Are you walking daily by the Savior's Son? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Excellent. Please be seated. Come on up here, boys and girls. We're going to sing, I'm in right, out right, upright, down right, happy all the time. What a favorite song. In right, out right. All we're going to just do pointer fingers today. In right, out right, upright, down right, happy all the time. All right, everybody got it? Let's see your pointer fingers. Exercise, let's stretch. And here we go. I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in and cleansed my heart from sin. I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. All right, let's do it again. We're going to do a little faster. Get your fingers exercise. Here we go. I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in and cleansed my heart from sin. Ready? I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. Oh, excellent singing, wonderful. What a beautiful song. Good job. Boom. Excellent. All right. Fantastic, boys and girls. See you all down later. Head on downstairs. Enjoy. So nice to see you all today. Everybody's recovering from vacation Bible school. Sounds like a fatigue syndrome or something. I've got, hey, Dave. Oh, man. He's like, oh, man. That's what happens when you sit on the end of the pew. I know. Would you mind handing those out for me? This is the same one you saw last week. We're talking about apostasy, and uh, let me open up my app here. Do, 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 do. There it is. I think that's it. Yep, that's it. All righty. We're talking about apostasy, and I would invite your attention 
Um, we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, because that's where we left off at last week. And there's a few comments that I'd like to make on that last point that we never got to, because I was too busy talking about other things, I guess. That's the sec- if I can say it, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There is a difference between heresy and apostasy, and although... Um, there is a difference. We kind of blend them together. I, I must admit, I blend them together all the time. Uh, really don't uh, see that much of a difference, but there is a difference. Heresy is just any kind of false teaching. It doesn't have to be um, uh, anything that has to do with anything that we, have cur- that we currently believe. It could be some completely off the wall, um, you know, like Spaghetti Monster. Uh, what's, what's the name of that religion, Eric? Pastafarianism. Pastafarianism, Okay. Has anybody ever heard, besides Eric and I, of pasta, Buzz, of course, a lot of shorter hands are going up, okay, because we do silly things all the time. Pastafarianism, it's a, it's, a, it's a satirical approach to whatever, and it's the, uh, it's the flying spaghetti monster, is that correct? Okay, so uh, you ever see, uh, if you're driving down the road, you know, you see the ichthys on the back of cars, you know, the fish symbol, the ichthys. Yeah, but then you'll also see like, you know, Darwin um, and then the Darwin fish and then the ichthys swallowing the Darwin fish. There's all kinds of weird things like that when, on the back of vehicles. Um, and then one day I was driving down the road and I saw the flying spaghetti monster um, decal on the back of a car. That, that got my... Uh, and so if you've never heard that, it's just one of those things you got to Google it, look it up on... Wiki, I, I think they have a wiki page. And so it's just a crazy thing. It's, a, um, it's humorous when you think about it, but the reality of it is it's kind of a satire against all religion and just a way of making fun of, of every kind of religion. So that in and of itself is not an apostasy because they were nowhere, they didn't have the truth. They're just kind of making up their own religion in order to be you know, uh, satirical against all religion itself. And so... So, the, um, yeah, the flying spaghetti monster and pastafarianism um, is kind of a spoof, but that's the mindset that some people have concerning religion. That is, in and of itself, that, that, that's, uh, that's, um, that's heresy. Uh, it doesn't, hold, it doesn't um, adhere to, um, you know, standard belief systems, so to say. Uh, it's far, it's way out there. Um, but apostasy is when it means to, uh, to go away from. So apostasy, uh, by definition, just the word itself, means to uh, you were standing somewhere and now you're from where, you're, where you were standing. That's what the word itself means. So there's, been a, there's a lot of apostasy. You see it early in the church. Uh, what was happening was, um, um, first of all, Gnosticism, was sneaking in. It was, it's, a, it's a Roman based on Greek philosophy. It's rooted in the teachings of Plato. It's a, it's a kind of a mystic way of looking at truth. And, and so the early church, that started infiltrating in. So folks were standing on the truth, and all of a sudden, you know, these philosophers, so-called, are coming into the church and saying, hey, there's, you know, you're missing out on something. There's a deeper meaning uh, and so they, they're, they're beginning to teach these false doctrines and people are starting to kind of move away from truth to the point where they were denying that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, uh, where they were denying the bodily resurrection. So all these things are apostasies. Paul makes that point in the book of Galatians of another apostasy, and that was the, 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 uh, the Jews that were coming in and saying, listen, you, you know, I, I understand you put your faith in Jesus, but you really haven't got the whole thing, you know, because you're, you're not Jewish yet. And, and we all know about Judaism from this week. Rabbi, we learned a lot of good stuff from the Shema and some other fun songs. We learned what gefilte fish was. And, uh, you know, once you've tried gefilte fish, you'll never go back, you know. And so the early church was infiltrated by these false teachers, and folks were, t- uh, and that's why Paul was giving the folks in, in Galatia such a hard time. He said, "You know, you had it. Who who has taken you so far away from the truth?" And and so into another gospel, if there is another gospel, 
Um, so he, he was having a fit about that. That's apostasy. Uh, early in my Christian life, I've only been, I was only saved a couple years. Um, uh, one of the companies I was working for, um, Process Industries Incorporated, uh, I was a draftsman. And uh, one of the guys that worked out in the shop, uh, we had, you know, it was a fabrication shop. So, you know, draftsman hanging out over here, fabrication shop over there. So I, I'm in and out of there all the time. One of the guys in the fabrication shop, I was out there talking to him one day, sharing my faith with him, which is one of those things I used to often do with folks I worked with. And, and uh, he, uh, he said, well, have you, have you got the second blessing yet? And, uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a young Christian. And I'm like, I didn't know there was a second blessing. Oh, yeah. And, he start, and, and then he starts bringing in these books, he's, uh, pamphlets and things. He said, let me, let me just give you some things. Of course, uh, that's Pentecostalism, um, and the second blessing um, is where um, in, in, in many Pentecostal churches, they're, they're not all like this, but um, what they would believe is that you can put your faith in Jesus and be saved, but then you have to then receive the Holy Spirit, normally evidenced by speaking in tongues, and then you receive that second blessing or, or, the, or the indwelling of the Spirit of God. So they, what they do is they disassociate salvation from the presence of the Spirit, this, this giving of the Spirit. And, and so he's given me this literature, and I'm reading. I'm, again, I'm a young Christian, a couple years in the faith, and I'm reading this stuff going, I never heard this stuff before. You know, fortunately, I had a pastor that, that helped me out, I, and I, I, I said, you know, I've never heard this before. And he he gave me, and my pastor, he showed me some scripture, gave me some other things to read, and I'm thinking, okay, I got this. Because if I have not the Spirit of God, you know, I'm none of his. And uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, right from, the, right from the get-go, I'm thinking, all right, this, this is bogus. Um, and so the bogus flag went up, and I, you know, um, I didn't go down that route. I'm very thankful, because that would have been, that would have been apostasy. If I had been standing on the truth, the fact that the moment I got saved, I received the Holy Spirit of God, I was sealed unto the day of redemption, I had everything necessary for a, a, a very successful, profitable, and, um, and effective Christian life. And then somebody comes along and says, you don't. And that, that's apostasy when you leave what you have, which is, what is the truth, for something that is not the truth. So very fortunate that, you know, at, at least I got some good truth and good teaching and didn't go down that route. But that's not the case for everyone. And, and so there is uh, just a reminder that no matter whether it's first century or 21st century, um, there, is, there are false teachings out there and false teaching breeds apostasy. And apostasy can be, you know, can be found in a lot of different forms and, and formats and things like that. It doesn't have to be even, you know, kind of an organized type of religion type of thing. Apostasy can be found all kinds of different ways. Uh, and, and so as we talk about apostasy, and I ask you please to turn, there to, uh, to turn <laughs> I'll say that right, to, um, did I say, yeah, it's 2 Timothy chapter 4. I, um, I don't know why I'm in 2 Thessalonians, but... 2 Timothy chapter 4, and let me, um, let me get down to where I need to be. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that, that turning, as it's speaking about in verse number four, uh, they shall turn uh, away their ears. That, that word, that turning away, is that, is that same word apostasy that we've seen um, uh, throughout our lesson last week, that turning away to, you know, where you're in the right spot and you go, go in the wrong direction. And so um, I want to talk about a remedy, uh, some remedies for apostasy. And we didn't get to that last week, but uh, one of the primary ones, of course, as you can see in, in this particular, these particular verses that, I ha that, I, that I've read, is the preaching of the Word of God. 
And you'll notice, of course, as uh, Paul is encouraging Timothy to, sit, to do a very simple thing, and that is to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, and using the word of God to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You know, the preaching of the word of God is an essential part of the, uh, um, of the means by which that we can avoid uh, being turned away. And so, you know, when we think about apostasy, sometimes, you know, um, you know, we often kind of group it in with some, you know, big false teaching, run off and, you know, join some, some cult somewhere. And certainly that does happen often. But apostasy is found a lot of different ways. And, uh, you know, people convince themselves of all kinds of strange things in reference to their faith. And, and then, of course, um, in, in doing so, it often pulls them out of churches and, thing, and things like that. Um, um, you know, we live in a, uh, we live in a culture today uh, that is so um, bent on tolerance. And the strangest thing is they tolerate everything except those that, those that don't tolerate them. I don't, I don't get that one. But, um, um, and so that, that in and of itself can end up being an apostasy <coughs> because I certainly do believe that God is a God of love, but that God of being a God of love doesn't mean you, you tolerate sin. And, and so, um, you know, for many, I was, uh, you know, driving by some churches the other day. Of course, we are living in Mount Holly, and, uh, you know, one of the churches right on the main drag going down the road there has a, you know, the little kind of the rainbow type of thing flag out front there, meaning that everybody is welcome type of mentality. Um, several of the churches in town are like that. Um, it's a, it's a mentality that um, has infiltrated many of those churches. I, I was reading uh, from that um, uh, book last week um, that one of my grandkids had passed along to me. And, of course, I, as I read that, I think you all uh, saw that last paragraph, that whole, that whole uh, uh, introduction about uh, being culturally relevant and accepting of the of the present situation, because in, in not doing so, the world is just passing us by. That's that's his point. The world is just passing by and not even giving us a glance. And and, and so, what can happen though in churches, whether it be the you know the L B G T B Q whatever whatever the latest letter is, uh, e- either it's that type of thinking or or many many other type of. Uh, of, uh, of trying to be more accepting to the world, what ends up happening is, is that the preaching of God, it, this, is, this is an apostasy when you no longer preach against sin in order to attract people from the world. That, that is an apostasy. And many churches have gone down that route, whether it be you know, the, the cultural phenomena that we're, that's happening today or as in several generations ago with the seeker service type of mentality, you know, promoted by, you know, Rick Warren, who was back in the 90s, and prior to that, of course, Billy Heibel back in the 80s. And, it, you know, that, they're just the newest names, and it, it has gone back multiple generations from that in different forms and fashions, and will continue on. And it's that mentality that the church needs to make itself attractive to the world. That's an apostasy. <laughs> There's nowhere in the scriptures where we're told that that is the mandate of the Lord's church is to make itself appealing to the lost world. Uh, we stand in contradiction to the world. We're light in darkness. And, the, you know, light has shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. And so that in itself is an apostasy uh, where you've taken, this is where we took a, you know, a church. Was, when I use the word church, I'm using it in a general sense. The church has taken a stand against social issues and against, against moral issues and against, um, you know, um, certain, uh, you know, against lifestyles that are, that, that are contrary to the word of God. And, and, then they, and then they're being told, well, you're, you're really alienating a lot of people. They're not going to come and listen to the gospel. And so what the, what's the church does? It lowers its standard. And says, well, we're not going to say anything about these things so that people don't, aren't offended, so they'll come out and at least, you know, hear the word of God being preached. And if you're not preaching a gospel that deals with sin and repentance, then you're really not doing anybody any service. 
So apostasy shows itself in a lot of ways. Again, it's not, you know, it shows itself in people leaving and joining cults, but it also shows itself in, in lowering the, um, the quality of what's being preached and taught in the Lord's church in order to attract a larger crowd or keep the folks that you have or not to offend anybody. You can label it all kinds of ways. But all those things are apostasy. And it, and it says very clearly in this portion of Scripture that we just read that folks are going to turn away their ears from truth. That, that's a reality. So the remedy for, uh, for that is not to change the truth. The remedy for that is to continue to preach the truth because it's the truth that transforms people's lives. When someone's life is transformed, then, talk about by the gospel of Christ, then they'll desire to want to get truth. So one of the, the greatest remedy for the, uh, for, um, to avoid apostasy is, as Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. You need to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It's to preach, it's to preach, it's to preach. And, and so... Um, the problem is there are many churches today that do not have a lot of preaching. Um, the doctrine is not being preached. The word of God is not being preached. Moral stories, nice lessons. You get to take a Bible verse, tell a little story about it, uh, make a little application at the end. Everybody says amen, goes get their lattes and heads home. And, and so and we had to move our coffee maker for vacation Bible school. This, I don't know how we're all going to make it through today because uh, the coffee maker is, is not in the foyer. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a, um, um, there's a um, copper, a proper copper coffee pot song about the cure egg. And maybe we'll have to sing that uh, this evening and see, uh, see how that goes. But um, the, um, the reality of it is, is that many churches don't have solid preaching. I'm not saying, you know, we're the only church around that preaches. I'm not saying that at all. But I, what I am saying is, is that um, as you get around and visit other churches, you'll find that less and less are actually preaching the Word of God. They will, they'll have the Word of God, they'll present the Word of God, but they won't preach the Word of God, and there's a difference. So... Um, several places in Scripture talk about apostasy uh, directly, and several have great examples of apostasy being dealt with. Um, there's no clearer one that I see in the Scriptures bes uh, um, beside the book of Jude. And if you will turn with me to the book of Jude. Um, now, uh, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus Christ, Mary and... Um, Joseph had other children after Jesus was born uh, as compared to what the Roman Catholic Church teaches of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, that, is, that is certainly not true. It's not found in the scriptures. Uh, but Jude, um, he is writing concerning apostasy. And of course, you know, that introduction, there's a couple introduction uh, verses there. I'll, I'll start there and then we're going to drop towards the end of the book here. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. Now, James, of course, is the pastor of the church in Jerusalem uh, during that first century. And, of course, that's, James is the one that, uh, that Paul uh, deals with all the time. He's going back to Jerusalem and happened to go through. Um, he was, when he was arrested there, James was the pastor of that church. And, of course, James writes an epistle to his congregation that's on, end up being scattered because of persecution. So this is the same James uh, that we see in the scripture here, not James the apostle because he dies very early uh, uh, in the book of Acts. Um, let's see here. Brother of James, um, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace uh, and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unaware 
unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God um, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I therefore put you in remembrance, and it goes on from there, and he has some great examples, a lot of Old Testament references, even some references even outside of the scriptures when he talks about the book of Enoch. And, and so he's got a lot to say uh, about contending for the faith. And so, you know, what we're talking about is when, he, when, when the word faith is used here, it's talking about what we believe in its entirety, not just an action of faith like a verb, you know, put faith in Jesus Christ, faith as in a noun, uh, like the entirety of everything that we receive from God, the structure of it, what we believe, why we believe it. It's, it's the whole package, okay? This is my faith. I practice my faith. I have, you know, I have faith, but I also practice a faith, and it's based on the Word of God. And so there, this word contending is talking about, that word contend uh, has to do with like entering into an arena, and getting in the mix, kind of say. Um, so it's it's um, it, it's not a it's not it, it's it's a very aggressive term, and so he points out the fact of how important it is for us to make sure, first of all, that we understand what we believe and that we're willing to take a stand for it. So as compared to apostasy where it doesn't take a stand for something, it moves away from where it once stood. So I want to focus on the last, uh, as you get to the end of this, it's a great little book. Um, it's well worth investment of time of running out a lot, running a lot of these references down and look at a lot of the Old Testament passages that are mentioned throughout here. Um, but I, I want to direct your attention down uh, to verse number 19 um, where it says this, uh, these be they who separate themselves. And, and so that work, that word separation does, it's not the word apostasy, but it has to do with this idea of moving away from something in, in reference to the truth. Okay, They separate themselves. Uh, and he makes note of their character sensual. That word sensual means driven by the flesh. So we're driven by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And people that are apostate are often driven by the flesh. It's how they feel about things. Or they, it's what they want. It's what, their, it's what their, their fleshly body wants. Um, I want more acceptance. I don't feel like we're doing everything that we need to do as a church. It's, you know, we're, we're not driven by feeling. We're driven by spirit and the word of God, okay? So that word sensual has to do with feelings, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, this is what it's talking to you and I, and that what we're talking about is remedies for apostasy. So how do, how do you avoid apostasy? Not only in our church collectively, but also, of course, individually. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, those just particular verses, um, there's a lot of stuff there. Did you notice? And uh, there's some very specific, well-pointed um, instructions in order to avoid being caught up in this apostasy and being, uh, being sucked off to the side and not standing where we ought to be. Of course, the first thing that he talks about is building ourselves up in that most holy faith. And, and so um, that word building up has to do uh, with um, um, it has to do with growth, but it has to do with the idea that there, you know, there is a foundation. What, what's the foundation of our faith, first of all? There's a couple, actually, there's a couple things that fall underneath that category with the foundation of our faith. The Bible, the word of God. And that is laid upon even a greater foundation, which is Jesus Christ. He is, the, he is chief cornerstone. That's where it all starts. Boom, right there. The foundation, of course, is what's laid by the apostles. And that's that, the initial teaching that we received. It's the scriptures all recorded. That's the foundation. 
And so upon that foundation, now we are building. So it would be kind of, it would, it would be, it would be uh, kind of, it would be ridiculous if someone were to go, if, if you've ever done a building project at all, you know, you know, you get, you get in there and uh, Danny, you've, you've poured a lot of foundations. You do the dig out there, you pour some concrete, you lay some block down, you got some, some couple chunks of rebar down there to hold things in place. And then there it is, and, and you build on top of that, right? Now, wouldn't it be ridiculous if, let's just say, Denny was going to build a garage in, in the backyard there, you know, for, for some reason a tree hit the old one, and he had to build a new one? That would be horrible, brother. And so, uh, so he's out there, he digs his foundation, it's right there, and, and, then he, and then all of a sudden he starts laying cinder blocks over here on the lawn. You think, what are you doing? I'm building a new garage. Well, why don't you build on the foundation? Oh, I think it would be better over here. I mean, that would just be ridiculous. And that's, that's, what he's, that's exactly what he's saying here. Build yourself up on, your most, on the most holy faith. That, that, you know, faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Why would you build anywhere else? It would not make any sense. And so his, his point being is that there, there's a, there, the requirement for building is that it's laid upon the foundation where it started at and not, we don't need a new foundation. We have the truth of God's word. It doesn't need to be reinterpreted for us. It doesn't need to be um, brought into a culturally significant method of interpretation. It is the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. It doesn't need to change. Uh, it has lasted all this time, not just New Testament, but Old Testament. It is just as significant and culturally applicable today than the day that it was penned. And, and so we don't move away from it. Also, when it comes to building, um, building, is, uh, and you'll notice it, uh, it says, uh, it, uh, it says, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, okay? That word building, is a, it, it's a progressive type of thing, not progressiveness, but it, it continues. I was uh, reading an article the other day. Um, there's a, the Harbor Bridge in, um, in uh, I think that's Sydney. Yeah, Sydney, Australia. The Harbor Bridge in Sydney, Australia, when it was built, um, um, it spans the harbor <laughs> there in Sydney. Um, it, uh, it takes five years they, they, uh, to do the maintenance on it. They start at one end of the bridge, and they're, you know, sandblasting. I guess the old-fashioned way, you just use a brush, I don't know. But they sandblast, and they, there's, they repaint it constantly, and, uh, and they work. And it takes five years to get from one end of the bridge to the other end of the bridge in order to do that maintenance of repainting the Harbor Bridge in Sydney, Australia. And, and guess, what ha guess what they do when they finish five years? Yeah, exactly. Then, then they start back over again. They, it, it never ends. And I, there's some bridges around here where they're always doing maintenance on too. I, I, there's certain roads around here I don't think I've ever been on without them doing maintenance, but that, that's probably a different story. But it, it doesn't end. So as soon as it finishes, it starts over again. And, and I, th I think about that when I think about our Christian life because, you know, our, our um, of course I just closed that file, you know. Our Christian life is, is a never-ending process of maintenance where we're constantly building ourselves up. Um, reading the scriptures, studying the word of God, making fresh application, hearing the preaching of God's word. I don't know about you, but when I sit down and read my Bible, there are times, even after 40 plus years, I'm reading something going, man, I've never seen that before. Oh, I love it when that happens. And I, and I you know, get a chance to hear some preaching and, and, and it, just, it just, it does something. It still does something to my heart. Even after all this time, and I'm encouraged, and I talk to some of you, and you're telling me about things you're involved in, the scriptures, and it, it just it continues to bless me. It just doesn't end. It's a continual building up, 
in our faith. And I, and I love those things. And, and, and so one of the remedies, of course, for apostasy is this continual work of building. Um, and please, again, back to the text there in, in the book of Jude, verse number 20, building up. Please notice it says yourselves. And, of course, the author of Jude, he's directing to believers, and he's talking to them and says, and, and, and I'm not saying that no one else is responsible to help you to grow, but I, this is directed to individuals, and it, we're being reminded that we have that responsibility. This is, Christianity is not a, is not a spoon-fed type of faith where you just kind of sit back there and I tell you what to believe and tell you how to practice your faith and tell you what to think and tell you all these things. Um, you know, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you and he is working in you and you have a responsibility of helping yourself to grow. And, um, you know, just like an individual, I can, uh, you know, I could, I could set a plate of food before you. I could put the gefilte fish out, but you got to eat it yourself, okay? And so, and I do want to say, I put that plate of gefilte fish left over from VBS out there, and there were several young folks that tried that, and many of them came up to me and said, Pastor, I'm trying to gefilte fish, and, and I'm just thrilled, you know. So, um, Sean, did you try it? Yeah. You going to go out and buy a jar? Uh, yeah, definitely. We're going to, it's going to be a regular. <laughs> I see your kids are very excited about this, yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, this is, um, you know, this is something that's very practical for us in the fact that we, we look and we say, you know, um, you can put food out in front of people and you can say, hey, eat this, and, you know, you got you to gotta, you gotta eat. The kids, too, you know, you got to eat. Um, you, you don't just, you know, invite somebody over to your house for dinner and walk over there and, and cut their steak, you know, and then start, open big now, you know. You, you don't do that, right? Um, and, and so it's the same thing with our, with our faith. You have a responsibility of, of eating the word of God, of feasting on the truth. Um, let's see here. Um, the Bible also says that we need to uh, pray in the Holy Spirit. That, that is not um, some fantastical uh, type of um, a blubberish type of speaking in tongues type of thing. Uh, there are um, some of the Pentecostal groups there uh, would interpret that in the such a pray, uh, of a kind of a, um, a an, almost angelic type of praying in a different tongue. That's not what it's talking about. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read another portion of Scripture. So you, if you want to write the reference down or turn to it, that's fine. But Romans 8 uh, 26, um, excuse me, yeah, 26 and 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so that, that verse of Scripture is talking about the intervention of the Holy Spirit of God while we're praying. Um, and he is directly involved in our prayer lives. And another verse of Scripture that I want to point out in reference to prayer, it's in Ephesians chapter 6. That, verse, that portion of Scripture in Ephesians 6 talks about the whole armor of God, you know, the helmet of salvation and, and the, um, you know, the breastplate of righteousness and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and we got the sword of the Spirit and, and we got, you know, the shield of faith and all those great things. But then it says... And I'm reading Ephesians 6.18. This is immediately after all that in reference to the whole armor of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching whereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And the, uh, um, the work of the Spirit of God in our prayer life is essential. So it kind of begs the question, can you have a prayer life that is not spirit-directed? And, and certainly we're warned against things like that. Um, Book of James, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss. And so your prayer life is all about, you know, you got your Christmas wish list with the God. God, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. Oh, and bless my cat. And, and, and you know, and we got... Um, our prayer life is, is you know, it's a, it's a selfish list, and that is not spirit-driven. 
So when the Holy Spirit of, uh, Holy Spirit of God is involved in our prayer life, we are, we are really, what we're doing is we're conforming our prayer life to the will of God. That's what it says back in the verse I read earlier uh, there in, in Romans chapter 8, uh, where, this, where the Spirit of God is, is kind of directing our prayers to incorporate the will of God. So it's an interesting thing, a fervent prayer life of an individual actually becomes a time where God is actually molding and shaping uh, what is going on in their thoughts and, and getting them to conform to his will. Um, you're really in a prayer, uh, you're not just reading through a list of things. And certainly we all have prayer lists, I know that. But a prayer life is more than just reading through a list of things. As we're dealing with issues in our life, things that are going on in other people's lives, we're praying, we're asking God to intervene, we're really searching God's will. He begins to conform our will to his will as we're aggressively working through our prayers. That will keep you from apostasy. I'm simply saying that's what Jude is talking about. He's saying, here's the apostates. Here's what's going on. This is what they do. This is what you need to do. You need to build yourself up in your most holy faith, and you need to pray in the Spirit. Spirit-directed, Spirit-empowered, Spirit-indwelt uh, in, um, prayer will keep you from apostasy. The next thing he has on his list here in, um, in this portion of Scripture, after he talks about uh, building yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God. Okay, that is, um, this is, um, God loves you, okay? And John chapter 15 is probably a great way of explaining this. I'm going to read verse number 9 and 10, John 15, 9 and 10. It says, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So this keeping ourselves in the love of God is, is not this idea that, oh, I don't, I don't want to do anything wrong because I, I know God loves me, but if I do something wrong, he's not going to love me as much and he's not going to be as favorable to me and I just got to be so careful. That's that idea of fear. And, you know, our faith is not driven by fear. Like, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to do something wrong and God's going to say, I don't love you anymore, you know. That's just so far from what the Christian life is about. You know, keeping ourselves in the love of God is, uh, is conforming ourselves to his will, desiring, wanting to understand what God wants from us, wanting to do everything we can to please him, and um, looking through the scriptures, trying to conform ourselves to what we see in the word of God. The Lord Jesus Christ says, you know, I, I followed my father's commandments. I kept myself in his love. Um, this is my beloved son in whom I well please. We hear, we hear that several times throughout the scriptures. And, and why was that? Because Jesus came down to do the, the will of his father. And so keeping ourselves in the love of God is that mentality we have, I'm here to do God's will. That, that's a remedy for apostasy, apparently, because it's on the list here. But simply... You know, wanting to do God's will. It's, it's not wanting to do what our will is. We're, we're not trying to figure out, you know, what's the, what's the best thing for me? Let me just say, you know, we have, a, we have a church, you know. We think, what's the best thing for our church, you know? Um, you know, we could come up with some collective things. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, as my pastor always say, you can, you know, if you want to draw a crowd, just hold a circus, you know. What's the best thing for our church? Well, we want to pack the pews. You know, let's have you know, you know, uh, you know, some kind of circus every Sunday, and uh, we'll have people coming out. Is that the best thing for our church? You know, some people would conclude that because it draws a bigger crowd. You earn more money. We we have more money. We can do more things. And is is that what it's all about? So, um, what does God want us to do? We look to the scriptures, we say, here's the word of God, this is what the scripture says, this is what we're going to do. By, by doing his commandments, talk about what God has said that we should do, 
we keep ourselves in the love of God. We're right there. As one pastor I had many years ago uh, would, had, had said, I, he probably got it from somewhere else, but I want to keep near the spout where the blessings come out. That rhymes. It works too, okay? And so we are keeping ourselves where we ought to be so that we can receive the greatest blessings from God, okay? It's following his commandments. It is, it's a remedy for apostasy. And, and so um, the last one, of course, uh, in that, just that small little list there in the book of Jude, in verse number 22, it says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And so that's that um, understanding that Jesus is coming back. Um, the Bible speaks about that often. Probably one of the clearest statements about that or the effect of that is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 2 and 3 that says this, um, Beloved, um, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So that hope that it's being talked about there, have this hope in him, is that hope of the return of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming back, and when he comes back, he's, a lot of things are going to happen. Uh, my transformation here, whether I'm dead and I'm resurrected or whether I'm raptured, um, but also, of course, uh, all, the whole, the, the, you know, everything that God has, has promised is all going to come to fruition it's, it's, and so we long for that day. And if you have, if you have your, your, your hopes set on the return of Jesus Christ and all the blessings that come along with that, that has a, a cleansing effect, a purifying effect. So not only purifying in reference to ourselves or we keep ourselves pure waiting for Christ's return, but also purifying as a church. We want to be exactly what God wants us to be as a church because when he comes back, we're going to be accountable to him. He's going to look and say, hey, this, uh, you guys have done a fantastic job. You have been fulfilling the commission that I, that I delivered to you as a church. And so, you know, we, there's some accountability there. So um, these four things that are mentioned in just these two verses in the book of Jude are a remedy for apostasy. And uh, I, I just want to invite you back to where we started there in, uh, in 2 Timothy as we uh, finish this morning, because 2 Timothy chapter 4, and then we'll be done. We'll actually be done on time. Oh, I love this. And 2 Timothy chapter 4. Um, where am I at? There it is, uh, where, where Paul uh, is writing to Timothy and he's charging him. Um, and, and he says in verse number four, to preach the word and to be instant in season, out of season. Um, the preaching of the word of God uh, is an essential part. Now, this is Paul talking to Timothy. Timothy was there in the ministry in Ephesus. Uh, Timothy has been um, kind of an extension of Paul's ministry as an apostle and so Timothy is being used by Paul in, in helping a lot of churches. And although he was there in Ephesus for quite a long time, Paul's saying, come on, uh, just leave that ministry and come on over here. And I, I really want you to be with me here towards the end. But, um, but Timothy, um, he's given these, these instructions to preach, to preach, to preach. So, I mean, I, to me, I take that very personally, that the responsibility that I have as a pastor uh, in this ministry is to make sure that the preaching of the Word of God uh, is the main part of our ministry. And uh, it's, it's easy to get, uh, get drawn away from that, I suppose, by a lot of trends uh, in ministerial trends nowadays. But you know, the preaching of God's Word ought to be an essential and central part uh, of the ministry of every one of the Lord's churches. And so preaching the Word, instant, in season, out of season, you know, that's more of a direction towards Timothy that you ought to be ready. There are, uh, you know, times uh, when things are good, times when things are bad. Uh, and always, uh, no matter what the situation is, as far as the society goes, or even personally, or whatever's going on, uh, to have the preaching of the Word of God as, as a central part of it, okay? Never drawing back from that. Because the preaching of the Word of God is one of the greatest remedies for apostasy. Once the emphasis is away from preaching, then apostasy can take deep roots within any ministry. And so we're not immune from that. 
So we have to be very careful about that in our ministry uh, today. And so um, we've been talking about heresy and apostasy. Uh, as I said, they often blend together very quickly, and, and that's all right. I think we all understand that there is a difference, but there is a, um, there's a lot of similarities. And um, uh, the, the, the greatest similarity, I suppose, is the fact that um, there are many false teachers in the world, whether they be in the church or outside of the church. There's a lot of false doctrine in the world, whether in the church or outside of the church. There's a lot of opportunities for believers to get sucked away from the truth of God's word uh, and begin to, to believe a lie often because of itchy ears they're just tired of listening to truth they want to get something else something a little more appealing to the flesh and not necessarily to the spirit so they get sucked aside so um if we can just end with just the warning this morning um and that is that the reality of apostasy and heresy is never diminished if the warnings were screamed in the first century they they ought to be um, billowed from the housetops even now because there's so much more. Um, there's a lot of junk out there. And the responsibility that we have as a body of believers is to make sure that we stay true to the Word of God. Stay in your Bible. Stay on your knees in prayer. Stay focused. Keep yourselves in the love of God and look for the Lord Jesus Christ's return. And we'll stay exactly where God would have us to be standing on truth. Thank you for being in Sunday school this morning. Lord bless you. We'll get our services started here in just a moment.